I'll, I'll probably start with uh, Anthony's official bio uh, from the website, and then we'll move on to your unofficial one. Sounds good, Jason. If that's all right, yep, we'll, just, we'll just get the uh, sanitised version out of the way. Yep. So after the roller coaster ride of Anthony's first startup, Love Film, or well, not even really your first startup, it was probably your third by that stage. Probably right? yes. Which sold to Amazon for something like three hundred million. Uh, he obviously came home to Adelaide and is now doing it all again with Sign. Uh, he spent 15 years in the UK building tech startups including Love Film, Redbus Media and ECN Live. As a co-founder of Love Film, which was a video on demand platform, um, was part of the team that sold that to Amazon in 2008. Correct. Well, for around 300 million or something like that. Round figures. In returning home to Adelaide, uh, Anthony took his experience back to Sign, and which is a visitor management system that digitizes the process of signing in and out of buildings. It's currently used in more than 1,200 cities around the world and has offices in Adelaide, London, New York, and more to be announced soon. Um, that's a fair initial start. It's fairly accurate. Yeah, good, good, good. So, well, that's, not, that's not even the right page. But we might digress and go back a bit further because before you were selling businesses to Amazon, yep. you grew up in Adelaide. Adelaide born and bred. And uh, you know, spent a fair bit of time on the wrong side of the tracks, <laughs> getting through the ghetto of Prince Alfred College. Yep, yep. And then onto some fly-by-night university called Bond. Correct. After which you became a lawyer. See, there's a long way from lawyer a lot to... Of, a lot of sins. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And, and so, and fr from there, what, what was your first, st I mean, when did you decide to stop being a lawyer and start being a startup guy? Yeah, so just unpacking a few things. And, and by the way, before we do start, I just wanted to say, um, well done, Jason and, and the team here for putting some energy into having these gatherings and, and doing this, because it's really important um, that we do this regularly in Adelaide. Um, and I, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but thank you for hosting us and having us all. So, um, thank you. I, 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 I'll go through a bit of, bit of history and I think you know, the object of tonight is please make it informal and ask any questions afterwards. But I, I uh, left Adelaide as we did in 1998, so showing my age. Everyone was going to London. London was the centre of the world at that time. Um, you really needed to, if you wanted to do a corporate job, get over to the UK and it was easy to get to. So. I, I, I was a lawyer over there for a while, but then I became a banker um, with, with uh, Citigroup, it was called Salomon Smith Barney. And back then, being a lawyer or a banker was kind of like being in tech now, to be quite honest. You know, it had the same sort of feel using finance and derivatives and option theory and things like that, which I was hopeless at. But a million dollar um, salary. Yeah, and it had a salary to it. So again, it was a safe option. but. Cutting, cutting a longer story short, short, shorter, but we will go through it, is I went off to New York as a banker and um, that was pretty much what got me into tech for some very strange reasons. So I um, was, was sent there as a, 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 an associate training and unfortunately that all um, meant that I was based in, in the World Trade Center. So I was uh, uh, there on the day uh, on September the 11th and I was in a technology team um, working out of Seven World Trade, and that um, meant that we saw everything happen, and we, our building collapsed, and all this sort of stuff. So I was in New York as a as a person uh, doing banking, and that was a big changing uh, point of my life. So we basically got sent back to London um, two to three months later uh, after we could get out of New York, and everything was cool. And one of my clients, who was a film uh, distribution guy. Uh, he was the first one to call me the day after September the 11th and he said, you're going to lose your job, I hope you're okay, you're going to lose your job, um, the world's going to be changing very quickly, when you get back to London, call me and let's talk about what you want to do. If you want to come in and read the paper, come in and read the paper and talk. Um, so I did that. I got back to London and uh, the, the legal career had finished, the banking career had evaporated and what we did is we talked about his film distribution business and film was really kind of cool then too. There was a lot of money pouring into film. Film distribution was really getting going. Um, and this guy was one of the distributors, uh, one of my clients as a banker, 
uh, for Bend It Like Beckham. So uh, the, the, the people behind Bend It Like Beckham couldn't get it film financed. No one would touch it. So my, my business partner, Simon, took a risk, took a, uh, uh, a punt on Bend It Like Beckham, and uh, that business is now Lionsgate UK. Uh, that produces oh, wow. uh, Mad Men and all that sort of stuff. So that's, a, that's another startup yeah, grind that we need to talk about. But w w what I got out of all of that um, was uh, the, the seed ideas for, for, for what became Love Film. So basically, if September the 11th hadn't happened, uh, my career path would have probably been completely different and it's that kind of sliding doors uh, feel. So, you know, terrible world event uh, changes things and then uh, your career gets changed very quickly and you have to be adaptable and agile. Very good. So that was a bit, I've done my homework and I thought a bit of a background, but I didn't realise that the September 11 World Trade Centre was the moment that you left town. So uh, I've got no more jokes left. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop heckling you now. <laughs> um, but if, if, if we... Backtrack even before Love Film. So uh, tell us a bit about um, Red Bus and ECN. Yeah, so uh, Red Bus was the film distribution company in the UK. Um, very, one of the, the, the smartest guys I've ever met uh, founded it and I learned a lot from him commercially um, and, and that business basically really grew. But what we realised that um, going to your local blockbuster video store and I think the thing that I want to sort of get across tonight is these businesses that start, that scale up into really big things, just start from very, very small experiences and ideas and, and really tangible things. And so I meet a guy who's involved in the film distribution business. He's doing really well, but he and I now decide that we're sick of going to Blockbuster in Maida Vale in London because the, the Blockbuster store stinks, the carpet has got rips in it, and he shares it and I share it, so it's a common experience. And we're just, we're just sick of Blockbuster, right? It's just bad. It's kind of like your local TAB. It's just, it's, yeah. So we start harping on about this, and then all of a sudden we want to do something about it because he's got film rights, and I've got technology experience within a banking context, so basically we uh, made Love Film start because we were able to source second-hand DVDs. So a global business that Amazon now own really started because at that point in time in 2003 we knew how to buy second-hand DVDs for basically nothing which were scratched and no one wanted. So we started the business with a very lightweight uh, website and a, um, a, a, a lot of free DVDs. Um, and then what we did, uh, Jason, is we had some other people that saw our idea and also this is in the context of Netflix uh, who my bank Citigroup covered and helped float an IPO they only had a million subscribers based out of the Bay Area so we had a, like a really good reference point and we said if the Californians are doing a DVD just like video on demand wasn't even in the picture then so if the Californians can send DVDs around the whole of America using the US Post which is okay Imagine what we can do with one of the world's best postal services, which is the UK, you know, the Royal Mail. Yeah. So that's kind of how it all started. And even within um, Love Film, so you started as a business called originally Video Island, is that right? That's the one. And there were a couple of other businesses like that popping up around the traps? So we started Video Island um, and it uh, was as I described, second-hand DVDs and then new DVDs. It grew, it grew very quickly to you know, a few hundred thousand subscribers in the UK. Our competitors emerged. Just uh, how did you get people to rent DVDs that were scratched and didn't work? <laughs> we cleaned them. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We, as we, as that? So, so there, there was a machine on the outskirts of, 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 the, of London called, a place called Surbiton, and we cleaned them up and we buffed them and we sold them. And, and, and that's how the business started. And then the studios in the UK got on board and we started opening up a whole new distribution right, which was a different, DV, a different rights window. So we started having a revenue share and all this kind of stuff. So um, what wasn't capable of happening back then was the compression technology and the technology to compress a, a, you know, a, a 30 gig file just was not there. ADSL was not there, MBN was not there. So we, were, we really started the business through this physical distribution. We had competitors. Then we got on a plane to Geneva. 
And that's when everything changed very quickly. So um, we had some other people that wanted to invest in the business and they said, we know these biotech guys in Geneva. This is 2003. Um, come and meet these biotech guys because they're pretty cool guys and they've made some biotech investments. Those guys ended up being uh, index ventures, which um, wow. are, uh, you know, back, back then they were biotech coming into technology and they are the investors behind Skype and basically anything that's good. So they put, it, uh, they put about uh, 1.5 million um, pounds into uh, a DVD buffing company uh, and then we, we, ro we rolled up the whole sector. So we bought uh, and did a share deal with a couple of the other, the other main competitor in the UK and um, rebranded at Love Film and then um, We'll talk more about what happened, but I thought I'd stop and let you speak. Yeah, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I, well, we're not here to listen to me speak, we're here to listen to you speak. So if you get a roll on, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> because, I, mean, I think I did some research on Wikipedia. So if you've, if you've got a startup and you've got an official Wikipedia page that's been edited 500 times and it's quite long, I think you know you've made some um, progress. But uh, in, on Wikipedia, it sort of talked about the fact that through the from, from the time that you started Video Island and, and, Red, and, and Red Bus through to Amazon acquiring the business, there was something like ten mergers and acquisitions along the way. Were they all plain sailing? No. So let's go. Let's go Everyone into. Everyone just the, went. Yes, deal done. Oh, moved on. Yeah, just high fiving all around. <laughs> um, highly political, highly distracting. So. I think the moral of that story is great business model, but in order to scale with the fear of Netflix maybe coming into the UK and also Amazon definitely circling and being pretty aggressive, there was a lot of corporate activity, which meant instead of a pretty clean, scaled startup, which we'll talk about later with Sign and the other businesses, it was a, it was a, a mix of a lot of people with a lot of agendas doing a lot of different things, and I think ultimately uh, that uh, held the company back. Because I imagine with, with all those businesses that ultimately merged and became Love Film, there'd yep. be no egos involved. People had already started their own businesses and thought they were doing just fine. How, how did some of them react when you said, why don't we, we're competing, why don't we try a lot in together? Yeah, I think once the other founders and the other companies got uh, around to the idea that we basically had an equally good platform but we had uh, the money and the firepower behind us, they really started to realise that we were not there to, to destroy their value and we needed them. Um, what emerged was, so that, that took a bit of time to bed down. Lots of rounds of finance, high growth, we're talking 10 to 15 to 20 million pounds over a uh, five year period. So a lot, a lot of growth, uh, mezzanine finance, debt finance, lots of acquisitions, all that stuff. Did, did you end up buying Amazon's DVD delivery business? No, so then what happened was Amazon found out about the business because we did a deal with Tesco. So the way we started really getting scale is we built our own brand and then we white labelled um, Love Film to be, uh, back then Tesco, the major retailer in the UK was just gigantic and they were taking on everything. And so we, we did a white label model, which the VCs and the, the corporate community really liked, where it was Tesco DVD rental powered by Love Film. So we had all of these different things going on, um, and Amazon found out about this, and they approached our board um, and some of the core shareholders through their you know, UK corporate development arm and said, this looks cool, can we take a stake? Um, and, and that was good. They took a 25% stake in the business, but all the founders um, and people who were really um, looking at the bigger picture who were still running the company sort of pointed out at the time that Amazon were kind of locking in the future growth of the business because they had a lot of control. So Amazon are by far the most shrewd, uh, ruthless, smart operation that you'll ever come across, much more than Apple and so forth from what I can see. And they, they got what they wanted and they invested into the business in 2004. And then by 2008, this was a company that was ready to IPO but Amazon had it by the, you know what. Okay, and, and at what point did you go from shipping discs to live streaming? And, and, and was that the aha moment in terms of future opportunity? Yeah, so 
It's a really, really difficult period from 2004 to 2010, 2008. This, the technology was kind of working, but not very well. Yeah. From 2000, from what I have remembered about it, you know, from 2009, 10 onwards, the streaming capabilities really exploded. So we tried a lot of, we spent, the company spent many, many millions of pounds on encoding technologies, trying to do it itself, trying to make sure that it pushed through at good compression rates, and, and, and it was just a failure, basically. So what ended up happening was Amazon's technology out of uh, Seattle ended up being implanted in to uh, Love Films brand in the end because the actual streaming capability of what was being delivered by our side of the equation ended up working pretty well, but not the best. So the core DVD distribution business was actually really important. It actually wiped it. So the, the disruption was thousands of blockbuster stores like across the US and the UK. That was the real disruption is just changing that customer behavior getting people to realise that they didn't need to pay late fees if they didn't return the discs, it was caught up in the subscription, blah, blah, blah. That, that was a good cash flow business. And Netflix, to begin with, was a DVD delivery business. Right? 100%. Yeah. Yep. Before it ever started streaming anyway. That's right. So Net Netflix didn't really enter the UK um, you know, until about four years ago, uh, maybe five. And uh, the, the love film Amazon entity grew and grew and grew out of a traditional distribution model with some pretty good streaming technology, um, which is now turned into Amazon Prime and all the rest of it, but never really could compete with Netflix. That's huge. And tell us uh, now, in, in the time between 2008 when you got out, did you spend some time on like Richard Branson's island or on your own island or? <laughs> Did you just come home and chill? Ka Kangaroo Island. <laughs> what a great place. If yeah. you haven't been there, get there. I've got a great, holiday rental great, just for you. Great, uh, <laughs> Granite Island. Um, we, uh, as the founders, uh, did pretty well out of it. Uh, nothing that was uh, life-changing, but d did well. The VCs did extremely well. Uh, and Amazon uh, uh, took the company out. I think it was actually 250 million pounds. So the company should have floated for a billion, uh, no doubt. but it was constrained corporately by, by Amazon. And you, as uh, a pretty serious venture capitalist back then, or certainly as a founder, you, th there was just no room for negotiation. So the point of tonight is to talk in confidence about some of this stuff. And there's definitely no uh, bad, bad blood or anything. Everyone did well. It was a good story. But the lesson learned out of it was, which is different to the, the, the time that we have now, back then, the, 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 the costs associated with, with running a business like that and the lock-in was so much worse that you needed Amazon to take it to the next level. And so there was just no room for negotiation. This is what we did. We scaled the business. We brought in uh, external finance. We had a smart group of directors and founders. And then Amazon got involved. It was pretty much a, a set piece. There wasn't a lot of room for manoeuvre. Whereas now, in this environment, which we'll come on to later, I think you can be a bit smarter. Because back then Amazon was Amazon, but it was still another tech company. So there were other tech companies of scale, of more scale. We knew who they were because you could get cheap stuff off their shitty looking website, but no one really knew what was behind the yeah, and they didn't what even was behind have, the curtain, but what was in their correct. vision for the world ahead. They had no idea. We had no idea and we had board meetings with these guys. Like no one even had heard of AWS. It just wasn't around. They were interested in distributing physical product across the UK because it's a small island. Um, and they knew that. And they did really well out of that and they uh, bought it. They ran it for a few more years and now, uh, I think it was earlier, late last year, uh, they, they closed the site. And Index Ventures, the group now, do they, do they have a stake in Amazon or are they so you bastards, we're not... No, no, they're, 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 I don't think they're board directors on, on, on the Amazon board, but they are at that upper level of having directorships on many of the huge global corporate companies. Yeah. So they, as an entity, grew from a couple of well, three brothers into a massive organisation. And so, you know, that's what's blowing me away is how those, those financial firms as well have grown from biotech firms on Lake Geneva into multinational technology venture capital companies. It's just massive. <laughs> it's cool. And so... Th throughout all that, you decided it's sold. London's not for you anymore. Uh, Home, home's calling a little. I tried to come home uh, for, 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 for six months or so, and um, the UK still had a real allure. 
it still felt like the place to build things and to do things, which I. It's and you're allowed to drink beers on the street outside the pub without the getting told to step over yeah. the white line. And that's, that's, that, that is true. Um, you can do many things in London. It's a really cool place, there's no doubt about it. And, and it's got a, a, a centre of gravity and it's got a huge 62 million person customer base. So you, you, you get out of a town for a while and then go back to it. And I sort of got out of a software and got much more involved uh, back in advertising and media, still with technology influences. So it becomes addictive. Like you, 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 st you, you, know, you stay there for two years, it becomes five, it becomes 10, um, and then it turns into 15, and then it gets pretty scary. So I ended up building other smaller businesses, um, and, and, and touch wood so far, all of the deals that I've been involved in are, are either continuing businesses or exited. And these involved anything from turning around a a bankrupt shopping trolley advertising business. So again, Tesco has got probably a billion shopping trolleys around the UK. That's maybe an exaggeration, but on every single one of those shopping trolleys, um, there are advertising banners on them where Nestle, uh, Unilever, Coke spend serious money doing point of sale advertising. So we got involved, me and So you're pushing it around, it's just looking at you going, it's just bye, coke, bye, at coke, you. Bye, coke. And everyone's trying to tell us, well, you should be putting your phone on there or make it a digital panel or, so because we were involved in tech and we just decided, this business partner and I had invested and set up Love Film, that we were just gonna do a much better job using barcoding technology and logistics and scanning and backend um, uh, uh, inventory management because this was a 20 million turn out, pound turnover business putting shopping trolleys in Sainsbury's and Tesco that went bankrupt and we couldn't work out why. So we applied tech in the back end um, and it wasn't as glamorous, but that was a really cool business. That was actually more fun in a way than Love Film because it had none of the other stuff. Is that because people kept stealing the trolleys? Yes. And pushing, that, pushing their mates down the street? Yes, you'd find them in Races. council estates. Um, I've done that. Yeah, done that. I've done it many times. I may do it tonight. Um, <laughs> So we, we, the, the, I, th I think you know, the, the moral of this story is the UK, which I now see Australia getting, is you just keep on rolling into, in, you can have an idea, you can come across a special situation or a deal or something, and then all of a sudden, within weeks and then a few months, it's actually a business. And that's what I think we're now getting going here in Australia, is just, is just doing that, just turning it around, restructuring it, starting up a business, um, it, and, and tech is important in that equation, but ultimately what I've learned out of these sort of, not deep tech, but sophisticated businesses like Love Film through to this, this other one, and then we'll come on to ECN, is that technology's just really been an enabler to help us do what we want to do, which is deliver better service. And, and through, throughout all of that, and despite all of that, you're back in Adelaide now, is that, family or you have a real belief that Adelaide can be a player in the tech community? It can got, be a boulder, it can be a I got deport, Austin? I got deported. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. No. Um, you can only have so... Did you actually it, get deported? No. It, it, <laughs> it's, it, it, you, you can only have, it's not the winters, it's the summers that get you in the UK. So you're really looking forward to a summer and you go away down to, to if you can, down to Spain or whatever, and it's great. It's then when you are working in the UK for 15 years, you get the winters, which are actually okay. It's the summers that are always disappointing. There's only so much of that, and it sounds ridiculous we're talking about the weather, but it's just drove me up the wall. So, uh, <laughs> Nearly as much as having an empty beer. That's it, right. Can the nearest person to the back fridge uh, so grab, it's a us, bit, grab it's two? A, it's, a bit, it's a bit like um, New Zealand, but we'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, <laughs> The UK is, was fantastic, but you wake up one morning in Adelaide in 1998 and say, I've got to go to the UK, I've got to get that out of my system, it takes a long time. So the same sort of event happens in, 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 in London, that it's just, it's just time. And then you start to come back here a bit more and you realise how good it is here. And so that, you have to get it out of your system and, and that's why we came back. And my wife Fiona's here, uh, who's heavily involved in our business now, and um, we thought bringing up uh, our, uh, our daughters oh, was much thank, better here. Thanks, Tone. Thanks, Tone. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Tone. Cheers. That's <laughs> everyone. Um, tell us a bit about Sign. So you're back here now. Did you start Sign 
in the UK or it was an epiphany when you got back here and couldn't get into a building to meet somebody or? Yeah, great, great, great point. So um, we moved back to, the, to, to Adelaide and we had a good look around Australia and decided that Adelaide for various reasons was just the, the, the best place to be. Um, and I Is just, Fiona from Adelaide? She's from Toowoomba. Oh. Nice. So we could have gone to Queensland, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, we could have stayed in London. We might have gone to the US. But we had a good look around. And I, I do have family here, uh, which is important. But we just thought Adelaide's great. The lifestyles here is fantastic. It just felt absolutely right. So you see this now all the time. All of my school and university colleagues were all in the UK from the late 90s to early 2000s. Everyone's out of there. Everyone's left. That's obviously a natural cycle. And, and now you speak to everyone that's come back to Adelaide and they couldn't be happier. And I think the playing field's levelled, and we'll talk about what we do um, in a minute, but you can build a global business from here, no doubt. It's actually an advantage being here. Um, so we, we, we came back to Adelaide and um, I uh, look for subscription businesses. I like software as a service. I like subscriptions where you're just adding value by consistent revenue streams. And so I started to look around for what we were going to do next. And I, I looked at uh, the Airtasker model. I thought that was pretty cool. Maybe we could set up an Airtasker business from Adelaide. So I, I think what, what happens... See how we got most of our furniture in here. That's right. looks good. It doesn't really. Uh, great. I just couldn't <laughs> lift it myself. It's just Airtasker.com. So, I, I, you know, before you just rush... By the way, you know, back to Love Film and all these other businesses, it's not like... Oh, it just happens and, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this, and it just starts straight away. I think what's key out of all of this is spending a lot of time thinking about what you're going to do next. And, you know, they're almost like, it sounds a bit strange, but they're almost like imaginary friends that stay with you for a while, these businesses. And they come and go, and they stay, and the ones that stay are the ones that really you know that they're just not leaving and they have to, you have to do something about it. And so subscription models... I really like for various reasons and I just basically looked around the whole technology market and looked at what area was not being serviced by a proper SaaS model and I looked at trade and exhibition events and the way you have to enter those and I, I just thought dealing with trade and exhibition people so yeah it was basically uh, the Is it like carnies? Yeah carnies, <laughs> yep. checking in them that's good. Um, Any trade and exhibition people in the room? <laughs> so <laughs> events they're fun, they're and conferences fun, was on the agenda. Looking for a mobile-based business because mobile was starting to get really important. Uh, subscription as a service. Um, and, and then I realised that I was doing a lot of travelling. So you started then in 2013 to check in uh, to British Airways, Virgin, <laughs> Qantas. You know, the, the airline industries were starting to tell me to check in on my phone and I was starting to think, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And then you'd hold it over the Qantas one and it would still print you a paper ticket. And I thought that's pretty naff. So it started to get into my head and I started to think, well, maybe I should be going to the uh, trade and exhibitions that I've been attending by being able to check in. And then um, I started to realize that the schools that we were starting to look at and the, the, the um, aged care centers that we were starting to go to, the, the, the childcare centres that we were starting to go to and look at. Everywhere you went was a paper book and then you would go to the loading bay of a building and that's pretty weird if you're down there but I was, I was scouting, looking at a big loading bay and you'd see all the contractors and cleaners all filling out a book and then they'd move that book over and they'd fill out another book which was the key register. Would you just bring in an empty box and pretend to yeah. deliver it look around? High vis, as someone said the other day, if you wear a high vis, vis uh, Viz jacket, you can get in anyway. And that's, that's, that's what we did in the early days, just put on high vis and just go in anyway. Um, so this started to get into my head about checking this and so, uh, I, 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 and then the visitor management, it's not, we don't really do visitor management, it's a broader thing than that, but I wanted to emulate the airlines because I realised that we talk about AI and automation and everything and the airlines through IBM and all the major global, you know, Accentures and that, they have spent billions of dollars trying to crack the code on how to check you all in to keep up with the cost of fuel and the arbitrage that's going on in their air. That's what's going on. So they had to do all of that automation 
because they would have got killed. There would be no airline industry. So that, I started to look into that, and we started to realise that the big kiosks that are in an airline terminal, um, maybe you could turn that into an app on an iPad. And so that's where it really started to kick off. We, we took that kind of user journey of validating yourself and working out who you were, and we spun up a very, very basic MVP here in Adelaide. Um, we took it around to all the schools. So the great thing about Adelaide is it's pretty uh, accessible. Is so the kids can check into the schools? No. Or so visitors can check into the schools? Yeah. So all the parents and all the visitors that could go to the schools could have a photo taken because, as you know, schools are pretty serious places and the staff that run the schools are pretty paranoid about security. So when we showed them a, an, an iPad that took a photo of the gardener or, or someone, maybe not you know, parents, that's a different thing, but they said, this is great, can we pay? How do we pay? So I knew straight away um, that some of the, the, the alpha test schools here in Adelaide, uh, if they were very fussy customers, and as they always say, Adelaide's a great test market and if you can do things here, I think that, I haven't worked out exactly why, but it is true. They're, they're, we're very conservative and very fussy and very um, particular about what goes on here. They try, people try everything, don't they? Well, Adelaide's maybe. not conservative. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, well, it's pretty I, conservative. Yeah, yeah we'll, we, we'll, we'll debate that. Yeah, it's pretty conservative. <laughs> okay. um, but anyway, we started off in the schools and we got all, uh, many of the major schools on an MVP. So then I thought, okay, this is, this is now a real worry because this MVP is not very good um, in, in our own minds, not for security or data reasons, but it just, it just wasn't that good. So um, I uh, uh, went and uh, approached Talent, and Sam, Sam's here tonight uh, from Talent, and I and approached Derek, uh, who's here tonight, and it's great to see uh, these, these people here tonight, because uh, the core to Adelaide is everyone is, is accessible, and you can pick up the phone and you can say, Derek, I heard your name, can we have a meeting, because this app that I've developed, shit, can you fix it up? And, Derek and I got on straight away, um, and his team's been fantastic, and we, we, we outsource things to begin with. And people know here in Adelaide that if you're growing, you're not going to do things with them all the time, but we did as much as we could, and we were sensible, very cost conscious, and we developed everything as best we could, and it just grew from 2000 and really late 14, 15. So it's really been only 24 months of proper sign, and um, it, 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 it just then took off. So. We, we worked with the local Adelaide teams here to, um, to get it to the next level, and then um, I uh, wanted to find the right uh, uh, technology stack here in Adelaide, and it was really hard. That's when I knew I was starting to get really worried and f trying to find people to actually develop in a modern uh, technology stack that was going to be scalable and not uh, based on old, older, older stacks. And um, we started recruiting and we found a team here and Matt, my CTO, is here tonight and the rest of the sign team are here. And what I then quickly worked out is that we were able to develop a really nice JavaScript-based technology using AWS, thanks again, Amazon. So between Amazon <laughs> and Apple, you know, we, we were able to quickly deploy in 2015 onwards, something that was world class. And that was the total different mindset that I'd never seen before because back in the London days with technology teams, you don't know, want to know what we had to hire and recruit to get things done. Now, we, and we, we're growing rapidly and the software team's growing hugely, but the, 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 the tools of the trade that are available to deploy things securely globally are, are just incredible. Do, do you have any problems when I mean, you've got a team of 30, is that right? Correct. Do you have any problems finding talent in this market or do you recruit it from interstate? Yeah, like <laughs> it's, it's problems every day, as, as Sam knows. Um, it's hard and it's hard to find the right grouping of people um, that enjoy working together and are, are cohesive and, and, and are not just slapping things together. So, but it's getting better and Adelaide is attracting people from all over the world um, that want to be here either because they want to be here or maybe they can't be in other places for visa reasons or whatever. I've I got to be honest, I think when people realise that how Adelaide's pretty well balanced and it's a nice place to live and it's not so expensive, it all just clicks. Um, and people are buying 
property here now, they're investing in Adelaide, and, and that's what I'm really proud of, is to see people from offshore come here and um, build a great uh, product and also make Adelaide their home, maybe not forever, but for a long time. Yeah, there's quite a few examples of that. You've got the Matt McAllowitzes, you've got yep. Tom Hadju, you've got a bunch of people, you've got Craig Swan in, uh, in yep. our audience here. I mean, there's, but sometimes I think Adelaideans are our own harshest critics. You speak to anybody outside of the state and they think, it's fantastic. We yep. see it on the telly, we see it when we visit. It's, it's the most amazing place on earth. Why do you guys beat yourself up about it? Do we, do we have an issue with self-image in South Australia? Yeah, I think, that, I think we do and we need to drop it quickly. We just need to now get on with it and um, have more events like this and scale them up and just actually change the dialogue and forget about jettison the, that kind of chat and analysing what we're doing. We're doing it and it's happening and it's just a great place to be. And I've been in meetings recently in Sydney and Melbourne where very senior people of clients or partners or whatever are Two or three years ago, from Sydney or Melbourne, you'd start to get a bit of an attitude about, oh, you're from Adelaide. Maybe so. Snow town. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and it just it rolled with it and it's fine. But now they're starting to say things in meetings like, oh, yeah, I want to come down. Should we arrange a time? And wow, things sound like, like a great place to live. You know, they say different things. Yeah. And that's just starting to, to, to change. But anyway, we're, again, we're, re, we're even psychoanalyzing that. Who cares? Like, there's so many people coming back. It's just a great place. It's like Austin. It's, we don't even need to compare it. It's just, it's just doing its own thing. And um, what matters is that we have fun here and it's actually a pretty decent place to be. And, and we are 75% of Australia's wine industry. How can you not have fun here? <laughs> cool. Um if there was one thing you wanted to leave with the crew before we wrap it up and get into said wine. Everything here is South Australian, by the way. We don't, can't promise the peanuts are, but everything else is. What would you leave with? The, Look, with the I'd leave it with, 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 with team. And, and what I've learned, and I'm very proud to say that I've worked with lots of teams and my team are here tonight. And um, without them, uh, sign wouldn't be growing as, as it is. And I think the right permutation or the right combination of people if you're lucky enough to get a group together that, that really works together, you know, they say culture eats this and whatever. The, the teamwork that I'm seeing here and the Adelaide community within my team and also things that Jason's doing and hopefully Craig gets involved in and so forth, we've got a great team down here. Let's just make it happen. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll, we'll quickly, um Open it up for questions just briefly at the front, but if you want to hit, you know, hit me, hit him up here at the wine bar at the. We'll, we'll do some here while we're in front Pay of the camera. Congratulations, incredible success ratio. What do you put that back to? And the number of things you went through today. It seems like your hit rate is more than anyone else. What would you put that to? Passing on things that don't hang around in your head long enough. You've just got to take that time. I think it's a three to six month period of, of thinking things through before you even go near them. And marry an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to, ask you, I wanted to ask the same thing. Have you fucked anything up? Uh, do you know what? Apart from internal uh, uh, politics and things like that, the deals that I've been involved with, uh, they're, they're, they're good trading businesses. So um, taking some time to, to pass on the deals and and think that they're not right for you because you won't be passionate about them every day, um, or the economics don't suit you, or they're just not your style. At the end of the day, you've got to reinvent yourself and pitch up 24 seven to people on the other side of the world or here in Adelaide, and you've got to project what your company's doing. And so many people get that wrong. They're the wrong fit for the industry that they think that they should be involved in. How's that? I think what was impressive was you taking an MVP to a private school and be willing to be rejected, which a lot it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough. Yeah, yeah. no, you've got to be able to, to back it up and, and um, push it through. Anyone else? What was it that uh, made, uh, like, how come you weren't able to catch up to Netflix's technology? You know, what made them so superior? Was it the amount of money they had behind them? Or, because you said with the streaming, you just weren't able to, to even compete with them. It's just the question, I think, if uh, for the vid, is that what made you not, unable to catch up with Netflix's technology? Yeah. I think it's, I think Net Netflix is R&D and um, based out of uh, 
California that really spent a good five year period looking at the way to distribute things properly, which they, if, you, if you look online and you look at all the failures and all the problems that they had, they were just more dedicated to it. Amazon was much more about online retailing and physical distribution. So I think it was a mindset, probably not a funding issue, but it was a technology race that Amazon just wasn't really willing to follow through on. If we hadn't been totally owned and taken over by Amazon, the Love Film proposition probably would have been acquired by Netflix because we had a much better plan for online distribution. Or floated. Correct. And then acquired by Netflix. That's what, that would have been better. Cool. <laughs> Anybody else? Before we adjourn to the... Oh, one back there. Uh, you said you spent some time kind of looking for your next what was that like? That's better. Derek, Derek's quite a, got a, quite a big piece. <laughs> 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 This is the question about looking for the next thing. What strategy do you... Uh, yeah, do you so you have, to, you have to come up with some guidelines that you have to stick to. So software as a service, mobile orientated, i.e. an app or a, a mobile angle, um, and something that would make money and not just take a lot of investment and be a punt. So the last bit's the hard bit because you only get to unwrap all of that and get into it once you have taken into account the myriad of assumptions that you have to, to really make a successful business work. And so you set yourself some pretty solid objectives and some um, checkpoints and some guidelines and you've got to stick to that and you, you've got to work through that and discard all the distractions. Cool. All right. Well, look, I think we might um, leave the rest of the questions for hovering around the room. So uh, I'd like to thank Ant Travelo for uh, sharing his story. Thanks, Jason. Thanks again.